Welcome, uh, welcome everyone. It's movie time. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, we we have another classic today. This is a classic movie from our Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment. And I think you're just going to so enjoy today's ride because uh, every time we watch a movie, we want to be freed of unconscious guilt. We want to be freed of unconscious fear and shame. And it seems like the ego is so clever and ingenious at, at inventing a world of pl places, characters, countries, continents, and a whole cosmos that, that seems real. And it really is just false evidence appearing real. But the only reason that it is appearing real, the only reason that the false evidence is the fear is appearing real is because it is still desired deeply in the mind. It, it, you wouldn't experience guilt unless you wanted to experience guilt. You wouldn't experience fear unless somewhere deep, deep in the deep rest recesses of the mind, of the subconscious mind, there was a desire for it. And you know that there's a prayer there in your heart for escape, but the prison of the mind that seems to be the ego seems to be so sophisticated, so complex, and so ingeniously wired and disguised to make divine innocence, divine pure innocence, completely out of awareness. So that's why these movies are very, very helpful. And um, I think, you know, part of the fast track to spiritual awakening, I've always said, is, is how the Spirit can use your your prayer and meditation time in a very effective way, and also relationships as a mirror of consciousness. Because the temptation to project onto the characters, the temptation to blame people or to condemn people or to find fault with people is enormous because it, of this unconscious guilt. It's a... Uh, it's a very ontological unconscious guilt. It's very, very, very deep. If you use an analogy of like from dentistry, you know, it's like if, like if you've got a problem in the root, under the tooth and in the gum, then uh, a dental procedure is usually a root canal, which is having to drill down through the tooth to get down to the obsessed uh, root, and then you've had, you have to try to treat that. But if the root is, is so infected uh, that there's a possibility you lose your tooth. <laughs> uh, if you have a very, very badly in infected root in your gum. So basically, what we seem to see in this world is the death of the body seems to be an ending, but Remember, the ego invented the body, and it invented birth, and it invented death. So you see how deep this mesmerism is. Sometimes people, even when people die on, the, on their gravestone, they'll put R.I.P., rest in peace. It's almost like a wish for the one who died. I hope you rest in peace. <laughs> but basically, Jesus says... Rest does not come from sleeping, only from waking. So, in other words, until we forgive, until we accept the atonement as Jesus did, until we, we really accept the correction for the error called ego, until we really see the impossibility of the ego, of the belief in separation, then we seem destined to play out guilt. And guilt can be played out in all kinds of personality quirks because the personality is just a mask. And you might say that this is a world of masks. Every, every separate person of all the 7.8 different, billion different people 
That's like 7.8 billion masks. And you wonder why you're stressed out <laughs> when your mask is not dealing well with some of the other masks. <laughs> you see? But, but Jesus is, and the angels are having a good laugh with all of this. You know, they're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> We've, we're offering such clear guidance, but wow, they, they don't seem to want to practice the guidance. <laughs> they, they still want to try to judge and point the finger. One mask pointing the finger at another mask. My mask is better than your mask. Your mask is evil. My mask is good. You know, it's a, it's a battle of the masks. But actually, Jesus says, truth does not fight against illusions. Nor do illusions fight against the truth. Illusions battle only with themselves. It's a battle of the mask. So <laughs> the masks are duking it out, and Jesus is basically saying, you will find no peace on the battleground. On the, on the battleground of the masks, you will find no peace. You have to come above the battleground. Up above the battleground is the only place where peace is found, nothing to defend above the battleground, nothing to, to fight about, fight against above the battleground. It's like a, a, a Holy Spirit perspective on high that just sees the impossibility of the, of the battle. It just sees that mind is one and mind cannot attack itself. And so if mind is one and mind cannot attack itself, then that means that the entire projected world is a hallucination of the belief in attack. You have to believe in attack before you can perceive it. I always used to say growing up, if you spot it, you got it, <laughs> which is a cute way to remember. Uh, if, you, if you believe it, you perceive it. If you believe in attack, you will perceive it. And if you forgive, you won't. Your mind is clear, your mind is clean. Your, your mind is lit up with the Holy Spirit's light and returns to that state of absolute love and oneness. So we have a real treat today because uh, Jesus has given us a comedy, a classic comedy. There is no better way to release guilt than a classic comedy. If you can laugh your way back to heaven, wouldn't you do it? I mean, who wouldn't want to laugh their way back to heaven? Where you start off with a little laugh, and then you start laughing louder and louder and harder and harder, and then finally you have a big belly laugh, like the Buddha. You have a giant belly laugh, and then back to nirvana, back to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So... Today's movie is called Trapped in Paradise. <laughs> Trapped in Paradise, 1994. And we have amazing actors. We've got Nicolas Cage, Dana Carvey, and John Lovitz. Uh, Nicolas Cage is always makes it into a lot of our Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment movies. He's just He's an amazing, amazing actor, but this one, he, he really outdoes himself in this movie because, yeah, he acts in so many different movies, but now we get to see the, the comedic uh, side of, of Nicolas Cage. We also have his, playing his two brothers in the movie, uh, Dana Carvey and John Lovitz. I don't know if you've ever watched a comedy in your life. I've watched a lot of comedy, and I have left hundreds of hours with these two comedians, Dana Carvey and John Lovitz, because in this movie, they're paired up as three brothers. Uh, the Furpo brothers. Even the name sounds funny, Furpo. So there's, there's Bill Furpo, <laughs> who's, who's played by Nicolas Cage. There's Alvin Furpo, who's played by Dana Carvey, and there's, there's Dave Furpo, who's played by John Lovitz. Now, what is so good about this movie is it is a masterpiece at showing that the human condition of the personality 
is a call for love. And with these three brothers, they, they all three have kind of a very intense relationship with each other because they tend to get each other in trouble. Uh, when it's just one of the brothers, um, it's tough enough. Is enough temptations enough for one brother? But when the three brothers are together, the temptations are very, very strong. Uh, basically, Bill, you know, who's played by Nicolas Cage, he's just trying to he's trying to turn his life around. He's just trying to to live a good life. He just wants to live a good life, have a relationship, and feel a sense of of peace and love and harmony and 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 his past as as with every past of every person on planet earth there's there is there is guilt associated with the past so he has some guilt but he wants to make a fresh new start he wants to have a new beginning he's trying so hard to not give in to temptation uh i think in this movie i there's a part two where he he like he sees somebody drop their wallet and uh, he looks at the wallet and then he, he picks it up and he counts the money, I remember, and then he is so conflicted because the ego part in him wants the money from the wallet that's been dropped and the spirit part of him is saying, do the right thing, you know, don't, don't take it, don't take it, take it back, find the owner. And this is the same split that's in the human, human psyche because the split mind, the Holy Spirit is just seeing everything's a call for love. There's an opportunity. Somebody drops their wallet. You have an opportunity to do a, perform a miracle and help them give it back. But the ego part, the ego is just the getting mechanism. And so Bill Furpo, he's gone through this temptation. He's... I think he's, they're maybe from maybe a Catholic family. They, they want to do the right thing. How many of us have tried just to do the right thing? We just want to live the best life we can and just do the right thing. And the ego is just saying, hmm, uh, nice try, but guilt is what uh, is underneath this entire world. The ego made this world as a temptation to forget God. The ego made this world as a substitute for love, as a substitute for happiness. The ego is saying if you attain things and certain outcomes and circumstances from certain situations in this world, from the people, places, and things, you can find your way to happiness. Even in the United States, uh, I believe it's maybe, was it the Constitution, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? That you're guaranteed the pursuit of life, liberty, and the, and the pursuit of happiness. The only problem is, Jesus is telling us there's really no life in this world, it's just images. Uh, the only real life is eternal life with God. So, if you're pursuing life in this world right away, you know, you're on the ego's playing field. Because the ego made up the body. It invented, it projected, invented the whole world. It made up all the bodies. It made up plants, animals, and it called these things organic life, and so on and so forth. Liberty, some of you know, another synonym for liberty is freedom. And the Constitution is saying you, you can pursue freedom. But Jesus has got a deeper question in his course. He says, what do you want freedom of the body or freedom of the mind for both you cannot have. So freedom of the body is just another construct, another false idol to chase. And, and the world would say, well, if you have money, if you have possessions, if you have bodily health, if you can travel, you know, you can fly in planes and go places and everything, you if you have uh, enough money, you can have the good life and, and travel for some people is part of the ego's trick. The Holy Spirit can use travel just as much as the ego can, but, but the Holy Spirit uses it for undoing guilt and releasing false concepts 
and releasing false beliefs and false thoughts. And the pursuit of happiness, basically that's our review lesson for today, that my happiness and my function are one. That's what I've discovered is that there is only one happiness and that's the, through the function of forgiveness. The more you practice forgiveness, which is releasing false thoughts and beliefs and, and, and lining up with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus, the more you practice forgiveness, you are guaranteeing yourself a happy experience through forgiveness because my happiness and my function are one. That is happiness. And let's say we haven't we all tried to find happiness in many ways. Yeah, we pursued it all right. It's in the Constitution of the United States, but we, it doesn't matter what country you come from or what, whether your country even has a Constitution or not. If you pursue it, in French, they have great foods, crepes. You could, we've maybe pursued it through the crepes. Uh, we, you know, we, we've tried. We've tried many things to find the happiness. And... And we've, we've tried it through pride and through building up an image of ourself and making a, a better, bigger image. We've tried it through many pursuits of pleasure in many ways, both physical pleasures and psychological pleasures. Although Jesus says that, that fantasy, which he says this whole cosmos is, fantasy is the attempt to make false associations and obtain pleasure from them. Interesting definition from Jesus. So it's one thing to say enjoy life, but I would say the, the most enjoyable thing of li about life is eternal life because it's, it's a love without an end. It's, a, it's a, a happiness, a joy, a peace without end. And then what constitutes life in this world is a projection of the ego. And it's just wanting you to chase the projections, chase the idols chase the images, chase the outcomes. So in this movie, we, what a, a, a master stroke here. We have, we have three brothers, and, and I just told you a little bit about Bill, who's played by Nicolas Cage. Then there's Alvin, and basically Alvin is a kleptomaniac. Does anybody here in the audience know what a kleptomaniac is? What's a kleptomaniac? Steal. An obsessive thief. A kleptomaniac. So here we have Bill Furpo, who's trying to live a good life, and he's practicing and facing his temptations as, a, as an individual the best that he can. And then here comes his buddy. Oh my gosh, Alvin, his brother, is a kleptomaniac. And then his other brother, who is Dave, Dave is, is a liar. <laughs> so, so we have Bill Furpo and, and Dave Furpo and Alvin. We have Dave is, is like, what would we call somebody who seems to lie very overtly and very obsessively? Maybe an obsessive liar. Okay. We'll just say that's the persona. That's the mask of of Dave is a is a com, compulsive, obsessive liar. Then we have the kleptomaniac played by Alvin, and then Bill is trying to do the right thing. And these three brothers have a mother. Now, you gotta love a mother's love. You know, a mother's love. When they talk about a mother's love, a mother will love her children no matter if they're guilty and, and they're kleptomaniac <laughs> and an obsessive liar. She just loves her sons and she wants the best for her sons. And, and I think, I believe it's maybe kind of Catholic and so she's, she wants the best for her sons. Now, they're going to come together and through a series of events, they are going to wind up uh, the three brothers are going to wind up in a little town in Pennsylvania. Now, some of you know our Lisa Fair is from a little town. This, this little town in Pennsylvania is an actual town there, and it's in the same county uh, where Lisa grew up. And this 
this little town is called Paradise, and it's an actual town. So this really is strong symbolism from the Holy Spirit and Jesus, because we have three brothers who are, who are brought together, and they're going to have to face constant daily temptations. Uh, Bill's trying to do the right thing. Uh, he's got his kleptomaniac brother, Alvin, and, and Dave, his, his compulsive liar. And when they come together, they're all going to be lured into paradise. But they also will be trapped in paradise. In other words, the Holy Spirit, it's like with a dog who poops on your carpet. Repeatedly, you put the dog's nose into the poop. They are being sent to paradise for some major healing. They are being sent to paradise to learn to forgive, to release guilt, to release blame, to release deception, to release uh, trying to hide and, and be a false self. They are going on the ultimate mission, and we're going with them. We're going to paradise in order that we may really take a close look at anything that we still believe in that's less than holy, that's less than, than perfect oneness, that's less than, than pure love, we're going to take a look in our own minds with this movie today to see if we can find any scraps of anything that, that God did not create. Any ego scraps of guilt, this movie is, is perfect for that. It's a, it's a huge forgiveness movie, and there's going to be another character that's going to come when they do arrive at paradise. There's, her name is Sarah, and Sarah's kind of intuitive, so when these three brothers arrive there, she's more than a little suspicious about them. She's her, uh, her BS detector, her intuitive BS detector is pretty strong. So she's going to, to have some very strong suspicions about these brothers. And the town itself is just, it's a beautiful town with a, a lot of very simple, loving people in it. And it's going to be taking place in wintertime. It will take place over Christmas. And then we're going to see a series of events that, that, the world would say, are very, very traumatic. One, uh, this is a very small town, and there's going to be a bank robbery uh, at, the, at the bank. There's going to be a bank robbery, and then there's going to be uh, hostages taken, and eventually the FBI, uh, there'll be federal agents that will be coming to this little town called Paradox, Paradise because of the big ruckus and the fuss. There's going to be a storm happening in Paradise, and I'm not, I'm not talking about just the snow. But, you know, sometimes people say a snow job is when you try to pull wool over someone's eyes and, and fool somebody. This is snow, a snow job, and, and you're going to have to see how does the miracle release the guilt of all this false identity, of all these false accusations, of false things that are going on. How is the power of love going to clean the mind in order that it can see that it has divine innocence? How are we going to go from a place of, of fear and doubt and guilt into a place of pure divine love and innocence? That's the journey of this movie. It's, it's literally going to paradise, getting trapped in paradise, and then having to go through a purification to find the real paradise, which is God, <laughs> which is the kingdom of heaven, which is nirvana. So this is going to be a beautiful, beautiful movie as we move through that. I think um, the townspeople are quite amazing here because they're just seemingly reacting and responding to events that they're not used to. This town is not used to its bank being robbed. This town is not used to hostage taking. This town is, is it's just adorable, 
simple people living their very simple life in a very small town in Pennsylvania in paradise and then these things. And then when the federal agents comes, when the FBI comes, that's just another thing that's, these are three very strange occurrences for the little town of paradise. But sometimes it's in the most strange and extreme situations that it's easy to find the, the forgiveness. Sometimes we are pushed to more extreme situations to find that forgiveness. I think if we look at Jesus' life, at the end of his life, obviously the Holy, it was the Holy Spirit that planned out the script of, uh, it's all in the present moment, but on, in the timeline it looked like uh, a man was going to be uh, tried and then uh, crucified, nailed to the cross, bleed to death, and then he would rise, rise to teach love and forgiveness uh, as the risen Christ. But, but crucifixion, most people would say, that's a pretty extreme example to, uh, to teach only love. In fact, Jesus says in the Course that, that the meaning of the crucifixion was teach only love for that is what you are. That seems like a pretty big stretch for what would seem to the ego like a bloody mess on the cross to be used to teach only love, for that is what you are. So we do sometimes need really extreme examples in order to, to see the love come shining through, in, in order to really see that, that we are innocent, truly innocent, that the truly nothing has ever really been done to us. Everything that we are experiencing is an opportunity to see that the Holy Spirit is with us in mind and for us in our heart. And, and all of the legions of angels are cheering us on to accept our innocence. That's all the angels want, is for the mind to accept that it's completely, completely, absolutely innocent always has been and always will be forever and ever and ever and ever. That's, that's the most, that's the glory of God. God and God's true creation of the Christ is so glorious that there's no taint of error. There's no taint of any mistakes in that divine per perfection, we'll call it, which is heaven. So, Sit back and enjoy it. I think you are going to laugh. You may fall off of your chair today with laughter because these are some of the best comedians on the planet uh, and they're in full stride. They are in absolute full stride. And yet the conditions can seem extreme and that means that the breakthroughs coming to see the divine innocence can even seem more extreme when you are able to go past these these false perceptions and really feel the glory that's right there. So enjoy the movie and have a good laugh. So you saw him in the car. Even Bill's just trying to live a life, do the right thing. And even then in, in the car, when he, for, for when he first comes and they come out of prison, he's basically saying, whatever you want me to do, whatever you ask me to do, the answer is no. And this is the the presence of love in him, trying to prepare him for the temptations that are going to be coming at him. You know how the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So when you're dealing with the extreme temptations, extreme compulsive lying, extreme klept kleptomania, then he's just trying to, to do the right thing, He's, he's got them now under his custody. They're on parole in the city. They're not supposed to leave the state. And, and just for the ring dings, <laughs> for the snacks, he says, he gives in and just stopping there once, you see what happens. He is just bombarded with temptations just from that. He's just, he let them go into the car the store to get the snacks and he's just watching and he's looking through the glass and he sees that that Alvin is emptying the the all of the cash from the cash register 
and, and he's the chaperone. He's the one who's got them in his custody. So there, it's kind of like having two little children that have, have not had any sense of discipline or any sense of kind of moralistic training, then, then this is what he's dealing with. But this, is, this will actually be the fast track to undo the guilt. Because the guilt is, believe me, it is buried, buried, buried deep. The ego has hid the guilt of the belief in separation in the unconscious mind. And human beings don't walk through this world thinking about unconscious guilt. It just comes up a little bit at a time, a little irritation, a little annoyance, sometimes a little up, being upset. It will creep up into the mind like a, like a cesspool that has some, some of its darkness leaking, leaking, leaking into the mind. And it will leak into the mind and it will also seem to be projected onto the screen of the world. So if you find yourself reacting and responding to things in this world that, that you, may, you feel upset in some degree or direction with, it's because the mind is just allowing that to come into awareness so it can be released. But that's, that's how the, the healing is occurring. And this is not on a conscious level. This, this is seeping into, it seems like there's external circumstances, situations, and characters that are doing the, the attacking or doing the misbehaving or doing the deceiving, but it's not. There's, there's nothing actively happening in the world of form. It's just an interpretation of events based on beliefs in the mind, and most of those beliefs are unconscious. So that's why it seems like for the human being, they can perceive that there's an actual external world outside of the body that's actually outside of the mind. Because the, the unconscious is, is so deeply rooted that it's never been questioned. Uh, Jesus calls the unconscious mind the unwatched mind, but, and Carl Jung called it the shadow, but basically these are just as unconscious beliefs. They're just decisions that have been turned into beliefs and now they are assumed to be true. That's why the external world seems real, is because the beliefs that made the world, including the ego, are assumed to be true. And Jesus is teaching us, he says, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your beliefs from it. So that's what the healing will be. That's where the release from guilt comes in, is withdrawing your mind, is getting to a point where you don't believe. You know, Jesus at one point says, you may believe there's solid ground under your feet. And that's just another assumption. There is no solid ground and there, under the feet because there is no feet and there is no solid ground. <laughs> but you see, anything from the, 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 the sun is bright, the sky is blue, assumptions, assumptions, everything in the entire fabric of the matrix is just a projection of unconscious beliefs. And, and that's why in this situation it's such a good movie because the main character here, Bill, he, his two brothers have got out of prison and they're going home to visit mom. And then you get a little feeling of the family dynamics. Mom loves her children and the children are dealing with a lot of guilt uh, in their own ways. And, and that's the starting point for us. So the Holy Spirit loves to use small town Pennsylvania movies. Groundhog Day, Punxsutawney, where Phil the weatherman goes and suddenly goes into a time loop. So the Holy Spirit can teach us that there's nothing real about the time loop and the only way that he can get out is by finding a new purpose, which he does take on toward the end of the movie and then he finds himself out of the loop of time. Now, we see our three brothers 
with all their unconscious guilt and shame and darkness, and they've been taken to paradise. This is a place where your secrets get exposed. This is a place where your private thoughts are flushed up. This is a place where if you have repression going on underneath that mask of kleptomaniac or, or guilt or lying, this will get exposed because this is like the sound of the name paradise. This is the town for miracles. The thing about it is, is the ego believes that, that the darkness must be concealed and kept out of awareness and the Holy Spirit knows that it must be released and brought to the surface of the mind where it can be looked at and given over to the Holy Spirit to be released. So we can see it's already happening. Uh, they drive into paradise, they're just in the street, it's, it's Christmas Eve and there's, they're just, all the people are, are getting ready there and they're, they're just moving about and here's this horse with the, with the sheriff's uh, boy on it and, bef and before the horse throws the boy, uh, it's Bill Furpo in the car saying, let's try to be as inconspicuous as possible. And then the Holy Spirit makes them as conspicuous mm -hmm. as possible. Because whatever the ego wants, the Holy Spirit knows it's going to take something else to bring about the healing. So they're just going there and they're just going to find this Sarah and do this favor for this man that seemed to write this letter and all this and that. And basically, it's all just a backdrop. It's all just a setup for forgiveness. It's all just a setup for lots and lots and lots of miracles. But you cannot see the miracles coming. Miracles are involuntary and, and they are not under conscious control. That's why even when people practice with the Course in Miracles and they're consciously trying to, to hear the Holy Spirit and be a miracle worker, the ego is in their mind saying, you'll never hear the Holy Spirit <laughs> and you'll never be a miracle worker. <laughs> and so it's basically saying, just forget about it, forget about it. But, but the Spirit works in ways using situations as opportunities, so there's going to be many, many, many opportunities for the miracle in this movie. And it's just going to come rapid fire, one after the next, after the next, after the next, because whatever the mind has tried to deny and hide from the Holy Spirit uh, is, is not going to take you to God's will, to know your will and God's are one. It's not going to take you to a state of open-mindedness. So it's just beginning. They've just around, arrived at the town. The, the sheriff's basically said, no, no, there's no, that's Sarah, there's a Sarah Collins and she works right over there and he points over to the bank. Well, for the three of them, a bank is, based on their past, that is just like an opportunity to score a big amount of money. Through, through the deception, through the, the stealing, and all of them have dealt with this in this issue. So, so of all places to undo the belief in loss and the, unbe the, the belief in thievery, this, this is a total setup because now their first opportunity is they look across and Sarah, they're looking for Sarah, she works at the bank. So you see, the Holy Spirit's taking the mind right into the thing that it will need to let go of the guilt in the most direct way. I know from, from working with many brothers and sisters over many years, I've seen it play out this way. If there's a strong guilt around money, I just watch how the Holy Spirit orchestrates things. If there's a strong guilt around sex, I watch how it's orchestrated. If there's strong guilt around re rejection or abandonment. It's, it's uncanny how the situations are arranged to provide opportunities to release the guilt. 
it's through the interpretations that the guilt is maintained. The ego interpretations are overlearned. So when people think of things like robbery, robbing a bank, right away, they think of it's a crime, punishable by prison, and so on and so forth. But to the Holy Spirit, everything without exception is an opportunity to let that guilt up and let it go. And, and to see the innocence, because, uh, I mean, there's a song that I, I like to listen to, and, and it's all about the goodness of God. Uh, and, and goodness is something that the ego has its own system of good and bad, right and wrong. But, but the goodness of God is a goodness, is a divine innocence, is a love that's not of this world. It's literally prior to interpretation. The, the mind has to be encouraged to give up all of its judgments because it won't know divine love until it, it gives up the judgments. It won't know the divine innocence until the judgments are given up. So the spirit has to find a way to take the mind back, back, back inside to a point where it just starts bursting and laughing at what it thought it did, it didn't do that what it was so convinced it was guilty of, it's absolutely not guilty of in the least bit. It's like a total aha awakening is what the whole spiritual journey is actually about. But you watch this movie and you see how these characters, every single situation is set up for the exposure and the release of the guilt. <laughs> Look at the lyrics of the song, Do You See What I See? Do you know what I know? Do you hear what I hear? You see, that's the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit sees only love and light, knows only love and light, and hears only love and light. And from them, the past, their past associations, they're like thinking, oh my gosh, we're in a bank, the security officer is asleep, the security camera cable is broken, and, there, and the safe is wide open. So you can see that the Holy Spirit will use what seems to be ego temptations to give the opportunity for the miracle. And you may have to face the temptations over and over and over. That's what Punxsutawney, that's what Phil, the weatherman, showed us in, in Groundhog Day. He had to keep facing his thoughts over and over day after day, day after day after day after day, until he changed his motive from getting to giving. Once he started helping the ladies with their flat tire, he helped the guy who was uh, choking with the Heimlich maneuver. Remember, Phil really had to change his purpose to giving, away from the getting, to get out of the time loop. Now we're seeing a close-up here in paradise where the, the seeming temptations of the world are only temptations to the, from the ego perspective, and from the spirit, they're opportunity for miracles. They're, they're opportunities to be used to find divine innocence. That's the only purpose the Holy Spirit has, is to find the divine innocence. So here we go. You just, if you watch this movie a hundred times, it's such a classic, you'll pick up new things every single time through because it's such a masterpiece of, of true, deep healing, releasing the guilt. So not only do they have their temptation thoughts coming up, but the ego, that's how the ego works. It will plant the doubt in your mind, the question, the allure of something, and then it also plants the things, the things that are necessary for the fulfillment of the fantasy, the fulfillment of the doubt thought. That's what this world was made for. The ego itself is a doubt thought about God. The ego is the belief that there is no God. The ego is the belief that God doesn't exist. And it's taken over now, the mind, and it seems to be the ruler of the mind. And what it does as the ruler of the sleeping mind, what the wrong mind will do, it will, it will not only plant and, and 
these seeds of discord, these seeds of temptation, but also it will also, it projects a world where these false desires are, are manifested in the form of lots of seemingly external temptations. And we're seeing it so clearly. First, you know, when Bill says, when they're just driving the car into town, let's be as inconspicuous as possible, something happens. The, the boy gets thrown from the, the horse. Everybody, there's a big crowd. And they're suddenly not inconspicuous at all. They ask about Sarah. They said, there's no Sarah with that name, but there is a Sarah Collins. She works right there. It's a bank. Then, now they're inside the bank, and you can see their, their characteristics playing out. And Bill is just thinking like, okay, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. No, 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 we're not. Don't even think about it. He, he tells his brother Dave, don't even think about it. And then as they're driving away, he says, if I had a gun, I would go back there and, and do that bank job. And then, then, of course, it's like, well, what would I tell you, says Dave, what if I told you I think there may possibly be a gun? You see? And then when he opens it up, it's all these guns. And this is how the ego works. That's what Jesus calls in the Course the attraction to guilt. It's not only that there's subconscious guilt, but that the ego has peppered the world with things and it will interpret situations as an attraction to guilt. Jesus even says in the Course that, that the ego is so clever that it makes guilt attractive. And, and you may think, wow, that seems like a pretty ingenious thing to do to, in this world to make guilt seem attractive so the mind will go for it and then that will reinforce the guilt. That's why the ego made time and space to keep the guilt hidden and make it so attractive that, that you don't even, you think you're just living a normal life. You think you, you're just doing the normal things that human beings do. But until you start to study A Course in Miracles and go deeper into the metaphysics and start to see the attraction of guilt, you believe, like the Paul Simon song says, you believe you're gliding down the highway when in fact you're slip sliding away towards death. And, and the, the mind has to have this exposed. The Course in Miracles, I think, it's the only book where I found has three subheadings, subsections in, in a chapter in a row. Imagine if you picked up a book and you just opened it up and you read three subsections in the book, of, subsections of the chapters. The first one was called Attraction to Guilt. Hmm, that's an interesting title of a subsection in a book. But what's the next subsection? Attraction to pain. Hmm, interesting. What's the next one? Attraction to death. If you picked up a book and you popped it open and you saw those three subsections in one chapter back to back to back, that might raise a little curiosity in your mind about the trick of this world. Because what author other than Jesus Christ, is going to put those three subtitles back to back to back. Attraction to guilt, attraction to pain, attraction to death. And you can see in this movie that not only are the temptations coming up everywhere, but also there seems to be the, the manifestation of those temptations in a way that makes it seem alluring that makes it seem like they want to repeat the past. And Jesus is telling us, we have to let go of the past. You can't keep repeating the past. You can't keep repeating the same mistaken choices, wrong-minded choices of the past, and be happy. So, the way to break the loop of the past, the false past, present, future construct that the ego invented, is through the miracle. So, it will take at some point, it will take an intervention of a miracle and it will take some way of showing the mind 
that it's not going to be held accountable for the past, but it's actually going to be released from the past to find the love and the innocence. So here we go. Hold on to your hat. We're seeing the beginnings of the unraveling of the ego. So you can see here they've gone with their temptations, their temptations where they actually went, bought the ski mask, used the guns in the back of the car for an armed robbery of a, of a bank, including all the people from the diner across the road from the bank. And this would be clearly, clearly, clearly what in the world's terms is, this is a crime, robbing a bank. This would be kind of called armed robbery. And, and of course, this is a world where there's, there's crimes and there's punishments. And basically, the, the whole system of crimes and punishments and, and the whole system of prisons and everything is all part of the, the ego's linear construct of time. It's all part of a projection to keep the mind guilty. It doesn't have anything to do with people who being guilty, because people are bodies, people are, are projections of this mind that, that believes in guilt. So, in the world, it's a world of crimes and punishments. And, uh, you know, we have phrases like, no good deed goes unpunished, and all these kind of things. Now, the Holy Spirit knows that, that the problem is not with what is happening with the behavior, it's the guilt in the mind. Because Jesus teaches us in the Course, what you do comes from what you think. So the temptations and the problems are all in the mind. In fact, Jesus goes so far to say that the body and the world is simply a learning device. The body is a learning device. And in this scene we saw where the Furpo brothers have, have robbed this bank and, and taken the money out and got the money and then they found, they, Bill said, oh, I still have the keys. And then uh, his brother Dave said, oh, once every season we can go back, kind of like, oh, that was a, the easiest heist we've ever had, we can go back. In the world's terms, it's the body that makes the mistakes, but Jesus actually says in the Course that the body is simply a learning device for the mind, and the body does not actually make mistakes and errors. It's neutral. It's just, a, it's just a symbol among symbols, among all the symbols in the world. The body is just a symbol. It's a learning device that the mind can use to learn forgiveness. That's exactly what this movie's about. It's about starting to see how is the divine innocence going to come through. Now they've, they've done the deed. They committed the act of an armed robbery. And they were wearing masks. They're their bodies, their personality selves, we know are masks, and they put masks on the masks. It's a double oblivion. It just shows you all the guilt that's projected onto the body and trying to hide, hide the body, hide the identity because of not being found, not being found by the police, not being punished, and, and so on and so forth. So this movie is good to show that it's actually, it's the the belief in private minds and private thoughts is where the guilt's coming in. And these private thoughts, that's why they're called private thoughts, is because they're held as secrets. Uh, if you, even if you go back to the beginning scene with uh, two of the Furpo brothers in prison, you know, uh, the, the board was basically talking to Dave saying, you know, you, we've been told by the psychiatrist that, that you can't tell the truth. And, and then the, the kleptomaniac, we see that, that he basically saw this uh, kind of shiny tie clasp thing and found a way to even take that as he was leaving prison. The, the guilt seems to be about the form. It seems to be about what the bodies are doing or not doing, but it's always in the mind. And there is no escape from the guilt until you see the guilt where it is and you choose choose the miracle. So that's why all of Jesus' system in A Course in Miracles, the entire system is built on right mind and wrong mind and learning to choose the right mind, which is the miracle. 
It's always a choice, moment by moment, and always in the moment we have a choice between the miracle and the wrong mind. The miracle brings us toward the light and the feelings of innocence. The wrong mind is what perpetuates the guilt. But it, it really, really, really doesn't have anything to do with the, the forms and the behaviors. Because here we have already now in the movie, we've seen the lead up to it, and now we've had what the world would call an overt crime, armed robbery in a bank in a small town, and, and they are not even close to facing that guilt at this point. They're just basically, the bodies are just acting it out, and that's just another acting out of guilt. But there has to be a way to start to expose it and to release it. So that's mostly what this movie is. It's now going to turn really more and more into exposure. And it's not exposure to make guilty, it's just exposure to see the falsity and release it. That's what healing's always about. It's releasing the false beliefs and the false thoughts. But that's in the mind. The behavior is part of a prearranged script and the behavior is just the past playing out. The ego's, the ego's linear time, it's script that it made up, it's just playing out. And the only way to to release that and to release the guilt is you have to, to release the entire thing. You can't do it piecemeal. You have to do it by, by coming to the holy instant. And the holy instant is the full release of the guilt. The miracle is like a glimpse, a little snapshot of, of release. But the, but the holy instant is what the Course is aimed at pointing toward. All these miracles are coming toward the atonement or the complete is correction for the ontological guilt and separation. So here we go. Now we've, they seem to have got away with the robbery and they seem quite pleased in themselves. Uh, they're there, they've got their, their, their car that they drove down in with the guns in the back. They've got their, their getaway car, which they used for the, the robbery and they've come back. And now things are going to start to accelerate for the Furpro brothers, if you thought it was funny before, they are going to have to face this unconscious guilt in a big time way. So now watch how the Holy Spirit, you know, how it says Jesus orchestrates time and space for the healing. Jesus orchestrates time and space to face the guilt. What do you think all the relationships are for on this planet? to face the guilt. All of the healing opportunities are just opportunities to, as Jesus says, choose again. I could see peace instead of this. So here they are, they've, they've tried to leave, travel north, the car, they start getting chased by a police car and their car goes off the road, flips upside down, off the road by a bridge and then as they've really reached kind of the point of now what, because their car is, is completely flipped over and everything, the orchestrations get even stronger now for them to face their private thoughts. They are not, the guy's just saying, hey, what, are you guys all right? You know, here, a friendly angel, are you all right? And then he says, you know, here, come with me, come in my, my car. He's taking them in. This will be a series of miraculous experiences, but the most important thing to remember is they're all designed to bring up the hidden private thoughts, the, the guilty thoughts of what was done. Here they are, they've used ski masks, guns, getaway cars. They seem to get away with the money, but it's their higher self calling them back to face the guilt in the mind, knowing that they will never be truly happy and innocent until they face what they think they did, and that means facing the thoughts and the beliefs in the mind. So you can see the guilt around the money and then all the generosity heaped on and heaped on and heaped on. You see how that brings the guilt into the mind, brings it more to the surface. 
because it's, it's certain interpretations of certain situations where there's an awkwardness, there's, a, there's an ill feeling. There's, it's more like it's not pushed out of awareness and repressed. It's more like the private thoughts are brought up because they're acted out in a way. And it's all just orchestrated by the Holy Spirit to flush the guilt out of the hiding place so that it can be exposed and released. Nothing ever good or bad is happening in the world. It's just orchestrated symbols to help flush up the guilt to choose again. So uh, it's interesting, uh, I had a call very recently from a friend of mine and um, she, we have Sabine here, this is Sabine Gildemeister, a woman from Germany who about four, four and a half, maybe, maybe about five years ago, uh, I was talking to her and I said, how's it going, Sabine? And she said, well, I just retired. I'm, I said, well, how's, how's retirement treating you? And she said, I'm, I'm, actually, uh, I'm actually quite bored. I don't know what to do with myself. I've been working all these years. I'm just so bored in retirement. You know, I'm trying to read the course and work with these things. But, but actually, I, I really don't know what to do with myself and how to get out of this boredom. And so... I had a call with her. I invited her to uh, to uh, Utah to come to the monastery for one of the festivals, and she did. And she told me that was a big heart opening experience. She said, "Wow, I would have never even saw myself going across the ocean like that in my safe little retirement uh, life with my friends and just bored out of my mind." And then. She, her heart started to open. Then I invited her to Mexico, and she came down to Mexico, and she was attending events, meeting people. Her heart was opening more and more and more. Then uh, she saw a post I made. I said, well, if you really wanted a fast track to enlightenment, uh, why not take a bus tour all around South America? <laughs> and she's she saw it and she went, wow, that sounds exciting, adventurous. But when she put it out to a lot of her friends, they said, yes, no, 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 no. Nobody would go on the trip, a bus trip around South America. So one time she, I said, well, you know, just stay open with the South America idea. She came to this mall where I was with, people showed up, songs came on the radio, and she basically got this idea to go to Peru and to Machu Picchu with all of the, the songs and the people showing up. We were just sitting there having a, a lunch in front of the subway and she's like, I still have some fears about that thought. One guy just walked, showed up and, and he said, oh, I, was, I lived down there in the mountains and I was a tour guide in Machu Picchu. And she's like, what? And, I mean, the whole table just filled up with witnesses, like, go, go, go. Well, she went down to there. She went down there four and a half years. She called me the other night. She has had this huge unwinding in her mind. Instead of her boring retirement, she went through this huge unwinding, living down there in high altitudes, going through all kinds of things as all this intense darkness came up. In fact, I think she said something even happened to her arm, and she said finally she, it was so messed up that she went back to Germany to have, like, it was more like a reconstructive kind of surgery to put it all back together. Her friends in Germany were like saying, oh, that's, what, what did you even go there for, and why would you do such a thing, and da, da, da. And she, her state of mind was so opened up from all these adventures in, in Utah, Mexico, and Peru, and with the arm and everything, that she just called me the other night to just say thank you. Thank you for inviting me on the adventure to heal my mind. I am so, so grateful. After her arm got fixed up, she, she left Germany again, to, and she was calling from Peru, and she's still down there. And I've never seen so, her hair was all fluffy and flying. 
She didn't look anything like when I did the first video call with her. She was like a shaman. She was like a German, former German shaman who was adopted by Peru and living in the high altitudes and her eyes were sparkling and her mouth was smiling and shining and, and she just had to call. She said, I just typed this thing out to you just to tell you how grateful I am that you came into my life. And then, and then uh, uh, Erpi was next to me and I said, oh, she's in Peru. Erpi said, where? I said, let's call her, find out where. That's where we got to see her sparkling, shining. It was so beautiful because it was all about the willingness to heal. It was all about the willingness to take the steps. A Course in Miracles is not an, a play of ideas. A Course in Miracles is not something that you, you just study and pontificate on and write papers and and take some kind of an intellectual stance on, this is a symbol of an invitation to really, really take the steps, to follow your heart. And you have to, like in the movie Revolver, uh, there's a great line, wherever you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. Meaning the ego is the master trickster at hiding in the unconscious and hiding itself behind all kinds of defenses, but if you actually take the journey and you listen and follow, if you go with pray, listen and follow, and you go on this journey with the desire to heal, you will be taken way, way, way outside of the ego's comfort zone, which it's projected. The body and the things around the body are part of a defense against the light. And you have to really go for it. You have to really go for it. And that's why I find when the mind doesn't go for it, when the mind tries to play it safe and secure by just going for what seems easy in form and not really following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then, then that unconscious guilt remains. And then people wonder, why did I get sick? Why do I feel bad? Why do I feel lonely? Why do I feel closed? I see, I see Joni there. Hi, Joni. There's another one, just like Sabine. You were, had your little life in Holland, were joining in some of these movie gatherings, and then you actually took the steps. You took so many steps. Nobody will know how many steps you took. You probably remember from what I was just talking about, Sabine, you could relate to that, because you had to go way, way, way beyond your comfort zone, uh, where you were living in Holland and go on the adventure of a lifetime to meet many mighty companions, to have your heart cracked wide open and go deeper and deeper into the release of guilt. And, and I could go through, I see AC there, AC's the same, you know. She came to, when I was in Cincinnati in the Peace House, she came all the way across there. She put her heart into this. She took hundreds, thousands of steps to, to be free. These are examples of people who don't cower before the ego, but who actually pray, listen, and follow. And the darkness does come up, but it's just temporary. It's, if you look at Joni, she's smiling. If you look at AC, she's smiling. If you could have seen Sabine's eyes glowing and her face smiling, you would see that these are symbols of actual healing, actual spiritual awakening, spiritual transformation, not just bantering around ideas on some online group. Uh, this is actual steps. And, and what it is, is this is just showing the willingness to pray, listen, and follow. It's, it's not just trying to be like they call it an armchair quarterback who sits at home on Sundays and says, oh, the team should have done this. They called the wrong plays. They should have done this. But they're not even in the game. They're just sitting in a chair watching the game. But what Jesus is saying is, if you want to get into the game of spiritual awakening, you've got to bring some chips. And those chips are pray, listen, follow. 
I see Kwana there. Her and her husband went off on a great tour to open their hearts up, sing their songs. Big adventure. They left their home in, in Denver to go on a big, big adventure. Is it scary to the ego? Of course it's scary to the ego. The ego, the ego doesn't want to be uncovered. The ego doesn't want to be exposed. So that is what we're really, really talking about. And there's Ken and Nana. Wow, I can't even begin. Ken started off in, in England. Nana started off in Georgia. Now, Columbia now, but I mean, it's like blow the lid off of the ego. It's like follow your calling like these people have done. Ken and Nana are, are launching off. They're going to be to, doing a tour of Europe. This is how you shine the light of God. But it's all for exposing unconscious beliefs. It's all for exposing the error and, and remembering the truth. So here we go. The movies now is just starting to heat up. You, they, the last house they wanted to go to, the last place was paradise. And the last house they would ever want to go to in their life is the bank owner, the, bank, the president of the bank and, the, and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson. They, they had to go there. And you saw the reaction on, on Bill's face when the door opened. You know, it was just, he was just shocked beyond, he could even imagine being shocked. But this is exactly how the Holy Spirit heals. The Holy Spirit brings to the mind the symbols that will flush up the contradictions in the mind, the, the second guessing in the mind, the times when there's, when there's been a hesitation, when, oh, I better play it safe, play it safe. You see, the Holy Spirit is not really allowing the mind to play it safe. So now on top of everything that the Furpo brothers are dealing with, they've got Sarah, who's very intuitive, and she's just looking at them like, I am not buying this. I am not buying any of this. She's, she's looking at them. She said she's going to get them to a bus station, but she is not buying any of it. And now we find that, that there's two uh, prisoners that have, have escaped the penitentiary to come get their mother and basically are going to find out this this guy apparently buried many people uh, they said to him uh, this gangster nobody would ever devil cross you because of all the people you've buried and they laughed so he's a notorious gangster so now if it's not enough to deal with paradise and the bank manager and his his wife now, here comes mom into the situation. Dear old mom, here comes a notorious gangster who's out for, for blood and death, and everything's being ratcheted up. And even though it's a bank robbery, the FBI, the federal agents are there. It's just using all of the key symbols to, to accelerate the healing, to, to finally reach the laughter to finally reach the joy, to finally reach the innocence. And this is how the Holy Spirit does it. This is a good example of, of how the Holy Spirit uses the forms to flush up the darkness and then calls on the release. Release the darkness to me, the Holy Spirit is saying. So here we go. Acceleration time. Now it's really going to accelerate. So, you know, the the problem with the guilt is this sense of lack. That's, that's where guilt originates, is this sense of lack. And then the, the lack just seems to be reflected in a world where reciprocity is just accepted. You have to pay for everything in the world. You pay, pay, pay. But then there's these generous acts of kindness that just come at you from all over the place. Here it is where he's got a whole sack of money that he has stolen and he doesn't have enough money to buy the ticket so he's he's telling her and she says go on home and he's yeah to see my mom and then she doesn't hesitate she pays the extra money but that's one of the 10 characteristics of a teacher of god is generosity but you see that's just the love from the heart 
coming out, that generosity of giving, that's just another simple example of, of true, deep generosity that's just guided. She's just following the joy in her heart. And she says, well, you're in paradise. And that's the state of mind that she's living in. Simple joys, simple generosity. And that is such a contrast to, to the state of mind that they've been living in. That, that all the Furpo brothers have had such a sense of lack that they've They've robbed banks before. They've obviously they they stole uh, big screen TVs, DVDs, all kinds of things that their mother was saying. Gee, when you were around, the house was full of all these things. And then Bill was saying, "Yeah, maybe, perhaps you know they were they stolen. You know that they they think of all the people, the owners of those things, implying that." This has been a life of crime. This has been a life of deception. It's been a, a life of taking, 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 and trying to get whatever they could while the getting is good. And now the contrast of the miracle coming up, slowly opening their heart up, slowly showing them there must be another way, slowly changing their whole perspective on themselves and the world with this generosity, this true heart generosity, the generosity of praying and listening and following, it's so powerful that it will win out. Love and generosity must win out. That's the destiny of everyone to experience that, that love and that generosity. The love that, that comes from God, the true kindness and love and generosity. So here we go. We're starting to see now the miracles. We've seen them, them fed for dinner. We've seen them clothed when they were cold. We've seen this woman giving them bus money. Sarah saying, I'll give you a, a ride to to the bus. Uh, it's just the man, uh, I think, is who, who took them when their car was flipped over on the side of the bridge. Uh, come on, come on, you're coming with me. I'm, I'm going to take you to my aunt and uncle. It's just one act of kindness and generosity after another. And that is what it takes. It's like the Holy Spirit has to convince the sleeping mind that miracles are available, that miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. But you can see the momentum now starting to happen here. So, <laughs> the whole thing was a setup. The whole thing was a lie. In fact, at the very beginning, he said, whatever you ask me to do, the answer is no. You see, the Spirit was giving him true protection in that situation. But, but really, this is what, the, in a larger scheme, this is what the ego is. The ego is a setup. And the only question you ever have in any moment is, are you going to buy the setup or not? Every single moment of every single day, you either buy the setup and feel guilt, pain, fear, suffering, doubt, confusion, so forth, or you choose the miracle. You know, we've just been doing these workbook lessons every day, and, and basically Jesus said, a miracle is a decision and a grievance is a decision. He was giving new names to the wrong mind. He was calling it grievance. And to the right mind, he's calling it miracle. And he's saying every moment of every day, you're either choosing the miracle or the grievance. And that's all the choice that you have and you have no other. So he's making it so simple. This is what the mind training's for to see that you know, my grievances hide the light of the world. Uh, he basically came out and said, holding grievances is an attack upon God's plan for salvation. And then in that workbook lesson, he says, the ego is making an active attack on God's plan for salvation. God's plan for salvation is the miracle. And an active attack is a grievance. That's what it is. It doesn't matter how strong a feeling you have, whether you just have a little bit of an ill feeling or 
a little irritation or even a little annoyance because Jesus says that that irritation is just a veil drawn over intense rage and fury. So the mind has all these defense mechanisms to try to make it seem like there's multiple options every day. But really there aren't. We always have a choice of purpose. Purpose is the only choice. The choice of what is it for is everything. And I, did, I went over the setting the goal section of the course recently. You cannot look back at this world and, and understand it in any meaningful way. It's the only thing you can do that would be helpful when you look at the world or you look at history, whether it's your individual history or just the history of the world in general, is to realize that you do not understand what it is and you do not know what to make of it. You cannot conclude anything from this linear world. And, and once you let the past go like that, you make space for the miracle. You make space for a whole new way of looking at the world. And here we see in this movie, they've been on the run. Wow, they were on the run in New York. They were on the run in paradise. They tried to leave. They got brought back again and again and again. And it's finally now in this diner that, uh, you know, basically uh, Bill had told Sarah, you know, I, I just don't know what to do. What should I do now? And I can't, can't uh, come up with anything to do to make it right. She said, think harder. In other words, he needs to pray to be shown what it is that he's guided to do out of the miracle. Let the miracle lead the way. And he says, I'm going to take it back. You've got the keys. I'm going to put it back in the bank. So you can feel his heart. His, his one brother, uh, Alvin, agrees with him and says, yeah, put back my share. And uh, it's actually Dave, the John Lovitz character, that's like, what? What are you talking about? You know, he doesn't want to surrender. In the ultimate sense, the ego is a belief system that the Holy Spirit wants us to give back. He's saying, when you believed in the ego, you tried to take something that you didn't understand. You tried to, to take on a belief in separation. And now the Holy Spirit is saying, give it back. Give it back to me. I will show you it had no effects. I will show you it didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. You just believed something that you really didn't want, and now it's, it's give it back. So the give, it, give the money back is kind of a symbol here of give the belief in separation back to the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Why would we keep it? Why would you hold on to a death wish? And that's, that's meaning don't hold on to private thoughts. Don't hold on to secrets. Don't hold on to anything that seems to involve a personal identity or a personal will. There is no will but the will of God's. To, to fight against the will of God is to fight against heaven. To fight against the will of God is to fight against our true Christ identity. And so even though this world seems to be playing out, it really comes down to just that one thing. Am I willing to give this tiny puff of nothingness back to the Holy Spirit, or am I trying to keep it and protect it? And every day, every moment of every day, we get to answer that question. Do I, do I give it back? Do I uncover it and give it back, or do I try to keep it? Anytime there's resistance, the mind is trying to keep it. Anytime there's defensiveness, the mind is trying to keep it. Anytime you try to put conditions on your brothers and sisters and say, well, I'll love you, but you have to meet these criteria and you have to do this and this and this and this and this, and then I'll love you. Those conditions are a resistance against the holy instant. It's a resistance against the atonement. Whenever you hold on to anything and you feel you want to be right about a particular circumstance, about a particular situation, about a particular scenario, there's Jesus again. He's saying, would you want to be right? 
about the way you believe the situation is or do you want to be happy and give up the setup. So they've just reached a point where they're starting to realize that at this particular scene, uh, it's, it's, it's actually uh, Alvin that's saying, no, it was all a setup. And he pulls out this kind of cold, damp, wet wallet and that was the wallet that originally uh, his, his brother Dave said, um, you left your wallet at the scene of the, the crime. <laughs> and then he said, there's police coming. You see how it just was one little cue. You left your wallet at the scene of the crime. Now the police, and hear the police sirens. And then they said, we need to escape, come, let's go to Pennsylvania. It was all part of a plan of projection, but it all started with one setup, and that was around the wallet. And the separation is just one setup too. It's like, would you rather be right about the way that the ego set the world up, or would you rather be happy in the miracle? That's, that's the decision we're making second by second, moment by moment. Okay, here we go. Let's see uh, how the Holy Spirit comes in real strong now. You can see it, how the Spirit's bringing it to the surface. Nicholas Cage, I need a ride, gets in the car. What's that thumping? What's that thumping? Oh, we don't hear anything. What's that thumping? Uh, it's been doing that all night. Ha, 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 ha. The surface jokes are covering something that's hidden. In this case, it's a mom in the trunk. And then they start talking about, he says, I'm in love. What's her name, Sarah? And then it goes on. And then he says, they kind of egg him to, to show the photo that he's got. And he brings out, now it's a photo of mom. It's gone from just thumping in the secret trunk and to the photo of mom. And that's when things get very serious. That's when the guilt's getting flushed up. That's when the gangster you know, pulls his gun. Before, it's a joke, because it's hidden. But once it comes into surface with the photo, there it is. And that's, that's the most uncomfortable thing. That's what the spiritual journey is about, when things come up and they seem uncomfortable to you. It just means that they were hidden before, and now they're coming to the surface. Now your mind is allowing them up, so that they can be seen for what they are and released. And that's the, that is a good example of the spiritual journey. Anything that was down there, anything that was kept hidden, any, any finger pointing, any accusations that come are all coming from a hidden feeling of guilt. Whatever it seems to be in form that triggered the thing, like the photograph right there in the car, that really, uh, the gangster, he, he just got furious. He right away pulled out his gun. And they threw, uh, they threw Bill out of the car because of the intensity of the rage and the anger. Like, here are the ones that robbed, robbed the bank that, in prison, he, he was proud that he had robbed this place. He said it was, it was a perfect, perfect setup. And now it, the rage of somebody who robbed the bank, oh, it was you, it all comes to the surface. And that's, that's why we need to go on this adventure of pray, listen, and follow. When we do follow, all we're saying is, Holy Spirit, orchestrate time and space to bring up the guilt. Let me meet the people I need to meet. Let me see the situations and the circumstances I need to have that will bring the guilt to the surface, you see? That's what the orchestration of everything is for. You can't make sense of it if you look back. In the setting the goal section, Jesus is basically saying, if you turn back and look at a situation or an event or anything in all of history that seems to have already occurred, it is only the ego that looks back. And therefore, you will not be able to understand anything in history or anything in the world. That's why lesson number one is nothing I see means anything. That's why the early lessons are, I do not understand what anything is for. 
is because you cannot ex understand anything at all by looking back. All you can do is be in present trust. All you can do is pray to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I give this to you. Let present trust guide the way. I will give you everything, and I will give you the whole world. And I will basically say, it's yours now. Let present trust lead the way. And what the Holy Spirit does with that is the Holy Spirit gives you prompts and guidances. And that guidance is basically your way to be unwind your mind uh, from the ego. The present guidance is the key. You can see it even in this movie. Uh, even though it was a total setup with the wallet and the police being called there because the sniper was on the roof, it was all totally a setup that Dave, brother Dave Furpo did. And then he even laughed about it, very uncomfortable laughter, like, oh. Uh, and then, why did you do, tell him, he says to his brother, this and this. But the whole scenario plays out as just one opportunity after the next to choose again and to just follow present guidance. In fact, I will say that the only purpose that this world holds is just as a backdrop for you to follow your guidance. There is no other purpose for this world. You know, Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. That's what he meant. Follow your guidance. Uh, all the great sages and mystics have said you have to be lined up with the Creator you have to be lined up with the source, that's guidance. The world doesn't have anything or mean anything. Recently I was uh, listening to an audio book by uh, Byron Katie and, and her husband Stephen and her were describing about how when she had her big uh, like epiphany when she was about 43 years old, she she lost her memory and all that was left, she said, was a tiny thin shadow of a memory of a woman. And that woman was Byron Katie. She had a full-blown experience of, of the connectedness and the vastness of all that is. And then it was, it was a period of trying to just stay in alignment with that, that isness, that vastness, and then seemed to move through time and space, but she was not regarding herself as that woman. She, was, she knew she was so much more than that woman, who was the, the little shadow memory. And so that's where we are in the movie right now. You can see that Bill has had his change of heart, and he was actually trying to take the money in the bag back to paradise, but again, the Holy Spirit had again rearranged who, who was the, the car that he got into. Where you don't want to go the, is, is the last place you would look. You know, where you don't want to go is where you'll find him. Where you don't want to go is where you'll find Jesus. Where you don't want to go is where you'll find Holy Spirit. Where you feel the resistance inside. And you've got that, oh no, <laughs> oh please, oh no. That is Jesus just saying, just trust and watch the orchestration. Anything that you fear will be seen in a new light. You will see it in a new light. And guidance will take over. Guidance will bring the joy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> he just got thrown out of the car now. Now, if you want to go to a section in A Course in Miracles that really relates to this next scene, it's called setting the goal. Because what Jesus is saying in the setting the goal section is, if you have your goal out front, and your goal is for truth, you will experience everyone and everything as playing their part perfectly. But, if you don't have the goal out front, then you will see that the ego will try to solve it by separating out various aspects of the situation. This whole movie has had all these different aspects running around, bumping into each other in the trunk of cars, kidnapping people, robbing banks, uh, 
running up and down interstates, flipping cars over and everything. But you notice now in this scene, they're all there. And the ones that aren't there are just about ready to come in too, because everybody's being brought together. And this is what Jesus means by setting the goal. See the whole world in a holistic way. Realize you cannot solve a problem by separating out different aspects and trying to deal with those aspects on linear time. This is the greatest teaching in quantum forgiveness. This is the greatest teaching in holistic perception. He's like saying, you know all those private thoughts you've been hiding and keeping secret? Why not bring them all together? Bring them all together and see their nothingness together. Let the Holy Spirit be the correction that solves the problem of the world. Let yourself see the world more sim simultaneously where all the aspects have been brought together. Don't dissociate and think you're going to solve some relationship problems over here, some Mother Earth problems over there, some ecological problems there, some financial problems over there. Jesus is telling us in Lessons 79 and 80, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved, meaning bring it back to the mind, see it's a misperception, the whole thing, and then let me recognize, in, in number 80, let me recognize my problems have been solved, are already solved in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is telling us in the setting the goal section is don't, don't try to separate the world into boxes. Don't try to separate the world into separate issues because he's telling us the only issue that you have, which is separation, has already been solved. The Holy Spirit solved the problem when it appeared. There was no need for the Holy Spirit until there was a belief in separation and then it was solved simultaneously. The Holy Spirit answered it. The Holy Spirit answered it in the mind. But when we think with the ego, then we're looking at separate situations. What, if, what will come in the future? Oh, I don't know. It's scary. Uh, who's going to handle my daughter or my mother or my brother-in-law or whatever? Ooh, scary, scary, scary. No, no. The problems have all been solved, but it's just trying to separate out different aspects and believing that you have many problems instead of one. The one problem of separation from God has already been solved. And that's why he says, accept the atonement. He doesn't say, invent the atonement. He doesn't say, figure out the atonement. He doesn't say, analyze the atonement. He says, accept the atonement. It must already be there if he's saying accept. So this is why you have to do those early workbook lessons. Nothing I see means anything. I do not understand what anything is for. It just on and on and on about not knowing. You cannot actually know something about the linear world and accept the correction. You actually have to surrender and say, I know nothing. I know nothing at all about this world. That seems to be the most humble thing that you could say, but it's actually the most accurate thing because you can't really accept the correction as long as you believe you already have defined the problem. And Jesus is telling us in Lessons 79 and 80, no, you misdefined the problem. You, you broke it into many pieces and now you've been playing the game of time and space to try to solve all those cracked pieces when it's actually the, the perception, the cracked perception that needs to be healed, and that's healed through the Holy Spirit. The other thing that is the problem is when, when you believe that you personally have to solve something, that is the most arrogant thing that there ever was, because again, the Holy Spirit is the corrector. To think a person can solve problems is to, to again look for problem solving where it's not. And, and Jesus was so good, you know, even in the Bible, they came to Jesus and they, they started giving him some uh, almost congratulations and giving him some, uh, some real uh, kudos and compliments and everything. And you know what Jesus answered to them? He said, why do you call me good? 
God is good. You see, even in that situation with the compliments, he pointed to the Creator. There's even a workbook lesson that says, I choose the second place to gain the first. And, and people always have questions about that workbook lesson, like, what is he saying? What does he mean, I choose the second place to gain the first? He's basically saying, God is the Creator. And the, the most humble thing you can do is accept yourself as a perfect creation in the mind of God. Accept yourself as the Christ. If you want to be humble, <laughs> don't, don't put your body self, your personality self down, because that's not true, that's false humility. But, but just be humble and accept your magnitude. If you want to be truly humble, you have to be able to accept your invulnerability. What does invulnerability mean? It means as you are, as God created you, you cannot be hurt. The world of projections cannot hurt you. If you are the Christ, you are invulnerable. And there's one point in the Course where he says, make your invulnerability manifest. That means stay in the truth, stay in true empathy, regardless of the situation. If, if you're watching the news some night and, and they go, oh, we're sorry to report that uh, there's been five nuclear warheads that have exploded over uh, four different continents. You know, what are you going to do? Accept the atonement. You know, it's still the same, the same thing. You have to accept your identity because nothing in the world can make you any certain way. You have dominion. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, is what Jesus said. He was just saying, accept your invulnerability. And if you accept your invulnerability, you're not going to have a violin and you're not going to be playing these sad songs about who done you wrong and who victimized you and, and who hurt your feelings. Oh, so sad, so sad. The angels are laughing when you pull that violin out. They're like, oh my God, these creatures, God, God help them. <laughs> They're, they, got, they got victimization uh, of itis. <laughs> they, they got victimitis. Forget uh, the itises of the world. They got victimitis. Because if you believe in victimization, then that's the, that's the, the killer belief in awareness. Not in reality, but, but you put yourself in a susceptible, vulnerable position if you believe in victimization and abuse. And when you make your vulner invulnerability manifest, you put yourself back into strength. Strength of God. When you're invulnerable, you must be the Christ, and that must mean God is real. If you're vulnerable, that's denying God. That's denying the strength of God. That's denying that God's the Creator. So we don't need to play the violin anymore. So here we go. This is one of the best scenes ever, when all the characters are now brought into the same room. And it gets even better when when all of these characters are brought in front of the town, the whole town is going to be brought together for the solution for this movie. Only the whole town can be used by the Holy Spirit to solve this one, to show there is no guilt. So you can see the guilt around the money and then all the generosity heaped on and heaped on and heaped on. You see how that brings the guilt into the mind brings it more to the surface because it's, it's certain interpretations of certain situations where there's an awkwardness, there's, a, there's an ill feeling. There's, it's more like it's not pushed out of awareness and repressed. It's more like the private thoughts are brought up because they're acted out in a way. And it's all just orchestrated by the Holy Spirit to flush the guilt out of the hiding place so that it can be exposed and released. Nothing ever good or bad is happening in the world. It's just orchestrated symbols to help flush up the guilt to choose again. So uh, it's interesting, uh, I had a call very recently from a friend of mine and um, she we have Sabine here. This is Sabine Gildemeister, a woman from Germany who 
about four, four and a half, maybe, maybe about five years ago, uh, I was talking to her and I said, how's it going, Sabine? And she said, well, I just retired. I'm, I said, well, how's, how's retirement treating you? And she said, I'm, I'm, actually, uh, I'm actually quite bored. I don't know what to do with myself. I've been working all these years. I'm just so bored in retirement. You know, I'm trying to read the course and work with these things. But, but actually, I, I really don't know what to do with myself and how to get out of this boredom. And so I had a call with her. I invited her to, uh, to uh, Utah to come to the monastery for one of the festivals. And she did, and she told me that was a big, heart-opening experience. She said, wow, I would have never even saw myself going across the ocean like that in my safe little retirement uh, life with my friends and just bored out of my mind. And then she, her heart started open. And then I invited her to Mexico, and she came down to Mexico, and she was attending events, meeting people, her heart was opening more and more and more. Then uh, she saw a post I made. I said, well, if you really wanted a fast track to enlightenment, uh, why not take a bus tour all around South America? <laughs> and she, she saw it and she went, wow, that sounds exciting, adventurous. But when she put it out to a lot of her friends, they said, yes, no, 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 no. Nobody would go on the trip, a bus trip around South America. So one time she, I said, well, you know, just stay open with the South America idea. She came to this mall where I was with, people showed up, songs came on the radio, and she basically got this idea to go to Peru and to Machu Picchu with all of the, the songs and the people showing up. We were just sitting there having a, a lunch in front of the subway and she's like, I still have some fears about that thought. One guy just walked, showed up and, and he said, oh, I, was, I lived down there in the mountains and I was a tour guide in Machu Picchu. And she's like, what? And I mean, the whole table just filled up with witnesses like, go, go, go. Well, she went down to there. She went down there four and a half years. She called me the other night. She has had this huge unwinding in her mind. Instead of her boring retirement, she went through this huge unwinding, living down there in high altitudes, going through all kinds of things as all this intense darkness came up. In fact, I think she said something even happened to her arm, and she said finally she, it was so messed up that she went back to Germany to have, like, it was more like a reconstructive kind of surgery to put it all back together. Her friends in Germany were like saying, oh, that's, what, what did you even go there for? And why would you do such a thing? And da, da, da. And she, her state of mind was so opened up from all these adventures in, in Utah, Mexico, and Peru, and with the arm and everything, that she just called me the other night to just say, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on the adventure to heal my mind. I am so, so grateful. After her arm got fixed up, she, she left Germany again, to, and she was calling from Peru, and she's still down there. And I've never seen so, her hair was all fluffy and flying. She didn't look anything like when I did the first video call with her. She was like a shaman. She was like a German, former German shaman who was adopted by Peru and living in the high altitudes and her eyes were sparkling and her mouth was smiling and shining and, and she just had to call. She said, I just typed this thing out to you just to tell you how grateful I am that you came into my life. And then, and then Erpi uh, uh, was next to me and I said, oh, she's in Peru. Erpi said, where? I said, let's call her, find out where. That's where we got to see her sparkling, shining. It was so beautiful because it was all about the willingness to heal. It was all about the willingness to take the steps. A Course in Miracles is not an, a play of ideas. 
A Course in Miracles is not something that you, you just study and pontificate on and write papers and, and take some kind of an intellectual stance on. This is a symbol of an invitation to really, really take the steps to follow your heart. And you have to, like in the movie Revolver, uh, there's a great line, wherever you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. Meaning, the ego is the master trickster at hiding in the unconscious and hiding itself behind all kinds of defenses. But if you actually take the journey and you listen and follow, if you go with pray, listen and follow, and you go on this journey with the desire to heal, you will be taken way, way, way outside of the ego's comfort zone, which it's projected. The body and the things around the body are part of a defense against the light. And you have to really go for it. You have to really go for it. And that's why I find when the mind doesn't go for it, when the mind tries to play it safe and secure by just going for what seems easy in form and not really following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then, then that unconscious guilt remains. And then people wonder, why did I get sick? Why do I feel bad? Why do I feel lonely? Why do I feel closed? I see, I see Joni there. Hi, Joni. There's another one, just like Sabine. You were, had your little life in Holland, were joining in some of these movie gatherings, and then you actually took the steps. You took so many steps. Nobody will know how many steps you took. You probably remember from what I was just talking about, Sabine, you could relate to that because you had to go way, way, way beyond your comfort zone uh, where you were living in Holland and go on the adventure of a lifetime to meet many mighty companions, to have your heart cracked wide open and go deeper and deeper into the release of guilt. And, and I could go through, I see AC there, AC's the same, you know. She came to, when I was in Cincinnati in the Peace House, she came all the way across there. She put her heart into this. She took hundreds, thousands of steps to, to be free. These are examples of people who don't cower before the ego, but who actually pray, listen, and follow. And the darkness does come up, but it's just temporary. It's, if you look at Joni, she's smiling. If you look at AC, she's smiling. If you could have seen Sabine's eyes glowing and her face smiling, you would see that these are symbols of actual healing, actual spiritual awakening, spiritual transformation, not just bantering around ideas on some online group. Uh, this is actual steps. And, and what it is, is this is just showing the willingness to pray, listen, and follow. It's, it's not just trying to be like they call it an armchair quarterback who sits at home on Sundays and says, oh, the team should have done this. They called the wrong plays. They should have done this. But they're not even in the game. They're just sitting in a chair watching the game. But what Jesus is saying is, if you want to get into the game of spiritual awakening, you've got to bring some chips. And those chips are pray, listen, follow. I see Kwana there. Her and her husband went off on a great tour to open their hearts up, sing their songs. Big adventure. They left their home in, in Denver to go on a big, big adventure. Is it scary to the ego? Of course it's scary to the ego. The ego, the ego doesn't want to be uncovered. The ego doesn't want to be exposed. So that is what we're really, really talking about. And there's Ken and Nana. Wow, I can't even begin. Ken started off in, in England. Nana started off in Georgia. Now, Columbia now, but I mean, it's like, Blow the lid off of the ego. It's like, follow your calling like these people have done. Ken and Nana are, are launching off. They're going to be doing a tour of Europe. This is how you 
shine the light of God, but it's all for exposing unconscious beliefs. It's all for exposing the error and, and remembering the truth. So here we go. The movies now is just starting to heat up. You, they, the last house they wanted to go to, the last place was paradise. And the last house they would ever want to go to in their life is the bank owner, the, bank, the president of the bank and, the, and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson. They, they had to go there. And you saw the reaction on, on Bill's face when the door opened. You know, it was just, he was just shocked beyond, he could even imagine being shocked. But this is exactly how the Holy Spirit heals. The Holy Spirit brings to the mind the symbols that will flush up the contradictions in the mind, the, the second guessing in the mind, the times when there's, when there's been a hesitation, when, oh, I better play it safe, play it safe. You see, the Holy Spirit is not really allowing the mind to play it safe. So now on top of everything that the Furpo brothers are dealing with, they've got Sarah, who's very intuitive, and she's just looking at them like, I am not buying this. I am not buying any of this. She's, she's looking at them. She said she's going to get them to a bus station, but she is not buying any of it. And now we find that, that there's two uh, prisoners that have, have escaped the penitentiary to come get their mother and basically are going to find out this, this guy apparently buried many people uh, they said to him, uh, this gangster, nobody would ever double cross you because of all the people you've buried, and they laughed. So he's a notorious gangster. So now, if it's not enough to deal with paradise and the bank manager and his, his wife, now here comes mom into the situation. Dear old mom, here comes a notorious gangster who's out for, for blood and death, and everything's being ratcheted up. And even though it's a bank robbery, the FBI, the federal agents are there. It's just using all of the key symbols to, to accelerate the healing, to, to finally reach the laughter, to finally reach the joy, to finally reach the innocence. And this is how the Holy Spirit does it. This is a good example of, of how the Holy Spirit uses the forms to flush up the darkness and then calls on the release. Release the darkness to me, the Holy Spirit is saying. So here we go, acceleration time. Now it's really going to accelerate. So, you know, the, the problem with the guilt is this sense of lack. That's, that's where guilt originates, is this sense of lack. And then the, the lack just seems to be reflected in a world where reciprocity is just accepted. You have to pay for everything in the world. You pay, pay, pay. But then there's these generous acts of kindness that just come at you from all over the place. Here it is where he's got a whole sack of money that he has stolen and he doesn't have enough money to buy the ticket. So he's, he's telling her, and she says, go on home, and he said, yeah, to see my mom. And then she doesn't hesitate. She pays the extra money. But that's one of the ten characteristics of a teacher of God is generosity. But you see, that's just the love from the heart coming out, that generosity of giving. That's just another simple example of, of true, deep generosity that's just guided. She's just following the joy in her heart. And she says, well, you're in paradise. And that's the state of mind that she's living in. Simple joys, simple generosity. And that is such a contrast to, to the state of mind that they've been living in. That, that all the Furpo brothers have had such a sense of lack that they've, they've robbed banks before. They've, obviously they, they stole, uh, big screen TVs, DVDs, all kinds of things that their mother was saying, gee, when you were around, the house was full of all these things. And then Bill was saying, yeah, maybe perhaps, you know, they were stolen, you know, that they, 
the, think of all the people, the owners of those things, implying that this has been a life of crime. This has been a life of deception. It's been a, del a life of taking, 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 and trying to get whatever they could while the getting's good. And now the contrast of the miracle coming up, slowly opening their heart up, slowly showing them there must be another way, slowly changing their whole perspective on themselves and the world with this generosity, this true heart generosity, the generosity of praying and listening and following. It's so powerful that it will win out. Love and generosity must win out. That's the destiny of everyone to experience that, that love and that generosity. The love that, that comes from God, the true kindness and love and generosity. So here we go, we're starting to see now the miracles, we've seen them, them fed for dinner, we've seen them clothed when they were cold, we've seen this woman giving them bus money, Sarah saying, I'll give you a, a ride to, to the bus. Uh, it's just the man, uh, I think, is who, who took them when their car was flipped over on the side of the bridge. Uh, come on, come on, you're coming with me. I'm, I'm going to take you to my aunt and uncle. It's just one act of kindness and generosity after another. And that is what it takes. It's like the Holy Spirit has to convince the sleeping mind that miracles are available, that Miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. But you can see the momentum now starting to happen here. So, the whole thing was a setup. The whole thing was a lie. In fact, at the very beginning, he said, whatever you ask me to do, the answer is no. You see, the Spirit was giving him true protection in that situation, but but really this is what, the in a larger scheme, this is what the ego is. The ego is a setup. And the only question you ever have in any moment is, are you going to buy the setup or not? Every single moment of every single day, you either buy the setup and feel guilt, pain, fear, suffering, doubt, confusion, so forth, or you choose the miracle. You know, we've just been doing these workbook lessons every day, and, and basically Jesus said, a miracle is a decision and a grievance is a decision. He was giving new names to the wrong mind. He was calling it grievance. And to the right mind, he's calling it miracle. And he's saying every moment of every day, you're either choosing the miracle or the grievance. And that's all the choice that you have, and you have no other. So he's making it so simple. This is what the mind training's for, to see that, you know, my grievances hide the light of the world. Uh, he basically came out and said, holding grievances is an attack upon God's plan for salvation. And then in that workbook lesson, he says, the ego is making an active attack on God's plan for salvation. God's plan for salvation is the miracle. And an active attack is a grievance. That's what it is. It doesn't matter how strong a feeling you have, whether you just have a little bit of an ill feeling, or a little irritation, or even a little annoyance, because Jesus says that, that irritation is just a veil drawn over intense rage and fury. So the mind has all these defense mechanisms to try to make it seem like there's multiple options every day. But really there aren't. We always have a choice of purpose. Purpose is the only choice. The choice of what is it for is everything. And I, did, I went over the setting the goal section of the course recently. You cannot look back at this world and, and understand it in any meaningful way. It's the only thing you can do that would be helpful when you look at the world or you look at history, whether it's your individual history or just the history of the world in general, is to realize 
that you do not understand what it is and you do not know what to make of it. You cannot conclude anything from this linear world. And, and once you let the past go like that, you make space for the miracle. You make space for a whole new way of looking at the world. And here we see in this movie, they've been on the run. Wow, they were on the run in New York. They were on the run in paradise. They tried to leave. They got brought back again and again and again. And it's finally now in this diner that, uh, you know, basically uh, Bill had told Sarah, you know, I just don't know what to do. What should I do now? And I can't can't uh, come up with anything to do to make it right, she said, think harder. In other words, he needs to pray to be shown what it is that he's guided to do out of the miracle. Let the miracle lead the way. And he says, I'm going to take it back. You've got the keys, I'm going to put it back in the bank. So you can feel his heart. His, his one brother, uh, Alvin agrees with him and says, yeah, put back my share. And uh, it's actually Dave, the John Lovitz character, that's like, what? What are you talking about? You know, he doesn't want to surrender. In the ultimate sense, the ego is a belief system that the Holy Spirit wants us to give back. He's saying, when you believed in the ego, you tried to take something that you didn't understand. You tried to, to take on a belief in separation. And now the Holy Spirit is saying, give it back, give it back to me. I will show you it had no effects. I will show you it didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. You just believed something that you really didn't want. And now it's, it's give it back. So the give it, give the money back is kind of a symbol here of give the belief in separation back to the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Why would we keep it? Why would you hold on to a death wish? And that's, that's meaning don't hold on to private thoughts. Don't hold on to secrets. Don't hold on to anything that seems to involve a personal identity or a personal will. There is no will but the will of God's. To, to fight against the will of God is to fight against heaven. To fight against the will of God is to fight against our true Christ identity. And so, even though this world seems to be playing out, it really comes down to just that one thing. Am I willing to give this tiny puff of nothingness back to the Holy Spirit, or am I trying to keep it and protect it? And every day, every moment of every day, we get to answer that question. Do I, do I give it back? Do I uncover it and give it back? Or do I try to keep it? Anytime there's resistance, the mind is trying to keep it. Anytime there's defensiveness, the mind is trying to keep it. Anytime you try to put conditions on your brothers and sisters and say, well, I'll love you, but you have to meet these criteria and you have to do this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and then I'll love you. Those conditions are a resistance against the holy instant. It's a resistance against the atonement. Whenever you hold on to anything and you feel you want to be right about a particular circumstance, about a particular situation, about a particular scenario, there's Jesus again. He's saying, would well, you want to be right? about the way you believe the situation is, or do you want to be happy and give up the setup? So they've just reached a point where they're starting to realize that at this particular scene, uh, it's, it's, it's actually uh, Alvin that's saying, no, it was all a setup. And he pulls out this kind of cold, damp, wet wallet and that was the wallet that originally uh, his, his brother Dave said, um, you left your wallet at the scene of the, the crime. <laughs> and then he said, there's police coming. You see how it just was one little cue. You left your wallet at the scene of the crime. Now the police, and hear the police sirens. And then they said, 
we need to escape, come, let's go to Pennsylvania. It was all part of a plan of projection, but it all started with one setup, and that was around the wallet. And the separation is just one setup too. It's like, would you rather be right about the way that the ego set the world up, or would you rather be happy in the miracle? That's, that's the decision we're making second by second, moment by moment. Okay, here we go. Let's see uh, how the Holy Spirit comes in real strong now. So you can see it, how the Spirit's bringing it to the surface. Nicholas Cage, I need a ride, gets in the car. What's that thumping? What's that thumping? Oh, we don't hear anything. What's that thumping? Uh, it's been doing that all night. Ha, 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 ha. The surface jokes are covering something that's hidden. In this case, it's a mom in the trunk. And then they start talking about, he says, I'm in love. What's her name, Sarah? And then it goes on. And then he says, they kind of egg him to, to show the photo that he's got. And he brings out, now it's a photo of mom. It's gone from just thumping in the secret trunk and to the photo of mom. And that's when things get very serious. That's when the guilt's getting flushed up. That's when the gangster you know, pulls his gun. Before, it's a joke, because it's hidden. But once it comes into surface with the photo, there it is. And that's, that's the most uncomfortable thing. That's what the spiritual journey is about, when things come up and they seem uncomfortable to you. It just means that they were hidden before, and now they're coming to the surface. Now your mind is allowing them up, so that they can be seen for what they are and released. And that's the, that is a good example of the spiritual journey. Anything that was down there, anything that was kept hidden, any, any finger pointing, any accusations that come are all coming from a hidden feeling of guilt. Whatever it seems to be in form that triggered the thing, like the photograph right there in the car, that really, uh, the gangster, he, he just got furious. He right away pulled out his gun. And they threw, uh, they threw Bill out of the car because of the intensity of the rage and the anger. Like, here are the ones that robbed, robbed the bank that, in prison, he, he was proud that he had robbed this place. He said it was, it was a perfect, perfect setup. And now it, the rage of somebody who robbed the bank, oh, it was you, it all comes to the surface. And that's, that's why we need to go on this adventure of pray, listen, and follow. When we do follow, all we're saying is, Holy Spirit, orchestrate time and space to bring up the guilt. Let me meet the people I need to meet. Let me see the situations and the circumstances I need to have that will bring the guilt to the surface, you see? That's what the orchestration of everything is for. You can't make sense of it if you look back. In the setting the goal section, Jesus is basically saying, if you turn back and look at a situation or an event or anything in all of history that seems to have already occurred, it is only the ego that looks back. And therefore, you will not be able to understand anything in history or anything in the world. That's why lesson number one is nothing I see means anything. That's why the early lessons are, I do not understand what anything is for. It's because you cannot understand anything at all by looking back. All you can do is be in present trust. All you can do is pray to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I give this to you. Let present trust guide the way. I will give you everything, and I will give you the whole world. And I will basically say, it's yours now. Let present trust lead the way. And what the Holy Spirit does with that is the Holy Spirit gives you prompts and guidances. And that guidance is basically your way to be unwind your mind uh, from the ego. The present guidance is the key. You can see it even in this movie, uh, even though it was a total setup with the wallet and the police being called there because the sniper was on the roof, it was all totally a setup that Dave, brother Dave Furpo did. 
And then he even laughed about it, very uncomfortable laughter, like, oh. Uh, and then, why did you do, tell him, he says to his brother, this and this. But the whole scenario plays out as just one opportunity after the next to choose again and to just follow present guidance. In fact, I will say that the only purpose that this world holds is just as a backdrop for you to follow your guidance. There is no other purpose for this world. You know, Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. That's what he meant. Follow your guidance. Uh, all the great sages and mystics have said, you have to be lined up with the Creator. You have to be lined up with the Source. That's guidance. The world doesn't have anything or mean anything. Recently I was uh, listening to an audiobook by uh, Byron Katie and, and her husband Stephen and her were describing about how when she had her big uh, like epiphany when she was about 43 years old, she, she lost her memory and all that was left, she said, was a tiny thin shadow of a memory of a woman. And that woman was Byron Katie. She had a full-blown experience of of the connectedness and the vastness of all that is. And then it was it was a period of trying to just stay in alignment with that that isness, that vastness, and then seemed to move through time and space, but she was not regarding herself as that woman. She was she knew she was so much more than that woman who was the, the little shadow memory. And so that's where we are in the movie right now. You can see that Bill has had his change of heart and he was actually trying to take the money in the bag back to paradise. But again, the Holy Spirit had again rearranged who, who was the, the car that he got into. Where you don't want to go the, is, is the last place you would look, you know, where you don't want to go is where you'll find Him. Where you don't want to go is where you'll find Jesus. Where you don't want to go is where you'll find Holy Spirit. Where you feel the resistance inside and you've got that, oh no, <laughs> oh please, oh no. That is Jesus just saying, just trust and watch the orchestration Anything that you fear will be seen in a new light. You will see it in a new light. And guidance will take over. Guidance will bring the joy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> he just got thrown out of the car now. Now, if you want to go to a section in A Course in Miracles that really relates to this next scene, it's called setting the goal. Because what Jesus is saying in the setting the goal section is, if you have your goal out front, and your goal is for truth, you will experience everyone and everything as playing their part perfectly. But, if you don't have the goal out front, then you will see that the ego will try to solve it by separating out various aspects of the situation. This whole movie, has had all these different aspects running around, bumping into each other in the trunk of cars, kidnapping people, robbing banks, uh, running up and down interstates, flipping cars over and everything. But you notice now in this scene, they're all there. And the ones that aren't there are just about ready to come in too, because everybody's being brought together. And this is what Jesus means by setting the goal. See the whole world in a holistic way. Realize you cannot solve a problem by separating out different aspects and trying to deal with those aspects on linear time. This is the greatest teaching in quantum forgiveness. This is the greatest teaching in holistic perception. He's like saying, you know all those private thoughts you've been hiding and keeping secret? Why not bring them all together? Bring them all together and see their nothingness together. Let the Holy Spirit be the correction that solves the problem of the world. 
let yourself see the world more sim simultaneously where all the aspects have been brought together. Don't dissociate and think you're going to solve some relationship problems over here, some Mother Earth problems over there, some ecological problems there, some financial problems over there. Jesus is telling us in Lessons 79 and 80, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved, meaning bring it back to the mind. See, it's a misperception, the whole thing. And then let me recognize, in, in number 80, let me recognize my problems have been solved, are already solved in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is telling us in the setting the goal section is don't, don't try to separate the world into boxes. Don't try to separate the world into separate issues because he's telling us the only issue that you have, which is separation, has already been solved. The Holy Spirit solved the problem when it appeared. There was no need for the Holy Spirit until there was a belief in separation, and then it was solved simultaneously. The Holy Spirit answered it. The Holy Spirit answered it in the mind. But when we think with the ego, then we're looking at separate situations. What, if, what will come in the future? Oh, I don't know. It's scary. Uh, who's going to handle my daughter or my mother or my brother-in-law or whatever? Ooh, scary, scary, scary. No, no. The problems have all been solved, but it's just trying to separate out different aspects and believing that you have many problems instead of one. The one problem of separation from God has already been solved. And that's why he says, accept the atonement. He doesn't say, invent the atonement. He doesn't say, figure out the atonement. He doesn't say, analyze the atonement. He says, accept the atonement. It must already be there if he's saying accept. So this is why you have to do those early workbook lessons. Nothing I see means anything. I do not understand what anything is for. It just on and on and on about not knowing. You cannot actually know something about the linear world and accept the correction. You actually have to surrender and say, I know nothing. I know nothing at all about this world. That seems to be the most humble thing that you could say, but it's actually the most accurate thing because you can't really accept the correction as long as you believe you already have defined the problem. And Jesus is telling us in Lessons 79 and 80, no, you misdefined the problem. You, you broke it into many pieces and now you've been playing the game of time and space to try to solve all those cracked pieces when it's actually the, the perception, the cracked perception that needs to be healed, and that's healed through the Holy Spirit. The other thing that is the problem is when, when you believe that you personally have to solve something, that is the most arrogant thing that there ever was, because again, the Holy Spirit is the corrector. To think a person can solve problems is to, to again look for problem solving where it's not. And, and Jesus was so good, you know, even in the Bible, they came to Jesus and they, they started giving him some uh, almost congratulations and giving him some, uh, some real uh, kudos and compliments and everything. And you know what Jesus answered to them? He said, why do you call me good? God is good. You see, even in that situation with the compliments, he pointed to the Creator. There's even a workbook lesson that says, I choose the second place to gain the first. And, and people always have questions about that workbook lesson, like, what is he saying? What does he mean, I choose the second place to gain the first? He's basically saying, God is the Creator. And the, the most humble thing you can do is accept yourself as a perfect creation in the mind of God. Accept yourself as the Christ. If you want to be humble, <laughs> don't don't put your body self, your personality self down, because that's not true, that's false humility. But, but just be humble and accept your magnitude. If you want to be truly humble, you have to be able to accept your invulnerability. What does invulnerability mean? It means 
as you are, as God created you, you cannot be hurt. The world of projections cannot hurt you. If you are the Christ, you are invulnerable. And there's one point in the Course where he says, make your invulnerability manifest. That means stay in the truth, stay in true empathy, regardless of the situation. If, if you're watching the news some night and, and they go, oh, we're sorry to report that uh, there's been five nuclear warheads that have exploded over uh, four different continents. You know, what are you going to do? Accept the atonement. You know, it's still the same, the same thing. You have to accept your identity because nothing in the world can make you any certain way. You have dominion. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, is what Jesus said. He was just saying, accept your invulnerability. And if you accept your invulnerability, you're not going to have a violin and you're not going to be playing these sad songs about who done you wrong and who victimized you and, and who hurt your feelings. Oh, so sad, so sad. The angels are laughing when you pull that violin out. They're like, oh my God, these creatures, God, God help them. <laughs> They're, they, got, they got victimization uh, of itis. <laughs> they, they got victimitis. Forget uh, the itises of the world. They got victimitis. Because if you believe in victimization, then that's the, that's the, the killer belief in awareness. Not in reality, but, but you put yourself in a susceptible, vulnerable position if you believe in victimization and abuse. And when you make your vulner invulnerability manifest, you put yourself back into strength. Strength of God. When you're invulnerable, you must be the Christ, and that must mean God is real. If you're vulnerable, that's denying God. That's denying the strength of God. That's denying that God's the creator. So we don't need to play the violin anymore. So here we go. This is one of the best scenes ever, when all the characters are now brought into the same room. And it gets even better when when all of these characters are brought in front of the town, the whole town is going to be brought together for the solution for this movie. Only the whole town can be used by the Holy Spirit to solve this one, to show there is no guilt. So now we've got the whole town. <laughs> now it's just not the main characters, the whole town. And the ego will always look to the world. Remember, I said when you look to the world or you look to, you look to the past. And when you look to history, you look to the past. And when you look to the past to find the problem, you can't find the problem because the belief in the past is the problem. So when a doctor runs tests on you in the hospital and diagnostic tests to find out what's wrong with you, whether you have heart disease or cancer or the flu or whatever, when the doctor's running a test on your body to find what the cause is of your sickness, the doctor doesn't know because there is no cause in the body. There is no causation in the body. When, when somebody at a, at a morgue does an autopsy on a body, to look at the body and the dead body to try to figure out what the cause of death was. That's the same thing. It's trying to find something in form that is the problem or the cause. And here we have the federal agent now. He's got the whole town, basically. All the people that were involved in the bank robbery are there and, and the, all the main characters, the gangsters. Everybody's there. And the ego will still attempt to, to figure it out, to say what's going on here, what happened and what's going on. We're aware from the movie that there's been some lies and cover-ups. But in the end, when you look for the cause in the world, when we, you look for the source of the cause in the world, you're looking for the source of the cause in the script. And the world has no cause. The world is an unreal effect of an unreal cause, and that cause is the belief in separation in the mind. So this whole world is projected as a distractive device 
to try to find false causes and false effects. And this is what the human condition is. It's looking to the world for causes and effects. In this case, the federal agent, the FBI agent, he's now finally got everybody into the same room. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because if everything, like Einstein said, everything is either a miracle or it's not a miracle, or as Jesus says, everything's a miracle or a grievance, and there's no possible difference, then it must be that the entire movie we've been watching was a miracle. And there were no grievances, and there were no mistakes, and there were no false things. If you can hear what I'm saying is, if you can see what this is, that there are no causes and effects in the world, you can realize that your body or anybody never made any mistakes. Because like I said earlier, the body's just a, a learning device for the mind. And the body, read it in the Course, cannot make mistakes. The body, the learning device is not subject to error. It's only the mind that has the power to interpret. And if it interprets with the ego, that's the error. That's the filter. That's the, the linear personal perspective. And if it in interprets with the Holy Spirit, that's, that's the miracle of forgiveness. So here we go. Now you're going to see where everybody's together. The FBI agent is going to try to find, sort through the whole thing and see who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. It's going to try to find where it all started, what the fault is, and it's impossible. It's an impossible situation. But watch how the miracle comes shooting through in this scene. The miracle is there for us to see. <laughs> wow, there we go. Bringing it all together in the mind. In the mind. That's where you heal the whole world. You are the savior of the world. That's why Jesus says, salvation of the world comes from me. He's talking about the mind. That's why it's so important to get in touch with the mind. The mind training is so important because you can't really put your mind in a position to accept atonement until you no longer project causes and effects in the world. And that relates to everything that we perceive. There are no causes and effects in all the, the learning of the world, all the different schools of thought, all the different things learned in school. The one thread of falsity that runs through all the learning of the world is the belief that there are causes and effects in the world. But as long as you believe that there are causes and effects in the world, you feel guilt because you think the world is doing something to you. Or the world can can influence your mind, but the world doesn't have the power to influence the mind. It's the mind that made the world, and not the other way around. So even when we think of ourselves as a body identity, and we think our parents were our cause, nope, Jesus says that's not true either. Because there's nothing outside of you that has a cause and effect relationship. You are not the product of the world. You are not the product of, of bodies, of, of governments, of, of learning, of learning institutions. You know, you can't blame your neighbor, you can't blame your country, you can't <laughs> blame anything. We watched uh, some weeks ago the, the movie where we combined Gandhi, Einstein, C.S. Lewis, and Freud and we very closely went in there to the realization that, that there was no causation in the world. That even Einstein, when he think, thought he had something to do with the atomic bomb, no. No, that's still false cause and effect. So this, this is how you escape from guilt, by getting the cause and effect clear in the mind that you are an idea in the mind of God, and God is the cause, and Christ is the effect. And that is the only true cause-effect relationship. 
because it's it's the creator creating the creation christ cre being created by god and and then how do you give up the world but except by seeing that god is the only cause and there is no other your cre your identity was caused by god and there is no other and that is the end of the the victimization story never again will you complain or point the finger that you are at the mercy of the world never again when you accept that fact then you are free you you know free will you have, you have remembered free will so i hope you enjoyed this uh, is everyone cheering for more comedies or we we have a lot of comedies uh, we can do this in a very fun way <laughs> we can wake up with laughter and and this was some big time laughter this was they were really playing it out all the metaphysics <laughs> played out in a ball of laughter just one huge ball of laughter Oh, Jason, thank you for the heart. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining today. I hope your heart feels filled up. I see Patricia's heart just flew open. Uh, <laughs> we've got all the, the side, <laughs> we've got all the special, <laughs> the special effects. There they come. The hearts are coming out. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Watch out world. <laughs> Here come the balloons too. <laughs> the ego is saying this is not funny. Where where, where are these special <laughs> effects going? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you with all our heart. We send our joy and our blessing. Thank you God for creating us in such love. That, and giving us this great helper within to understand that we are love. We are all love. We are all just pure, pure, pure love. Have a beautiful Saturday wherever you are in the world. And if you're in Australia, then happy tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>